Good morning, um, everyone. It's um, it's 9 a.m. for me, so good morning. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to be with you again and to uh, keep on interacting in spite of the uh, crazy times that we're all living uh, all over the world. It's fantastic that we still have the opportunity to keep on learning and, and, and enjoying uh, the opportunity of professional development through those amazing webinars that National Geographic Learning um, organizes for us. So. Uh, as you heard before, my name is Jair Felix. I work for National Geographic Learning as, um, as a senior academic consultant in Latin America. I'm based in Mexico. Uh, and uh, I've been in the English language teaching field for um, close to 25 years now. Uh, and most of that time, I've spent it teaching English to teenagers. I have to say that perhaps they're my favorite audience, apart from teachers. Um, teaching English to teens has been um, an activity that I truly um, enjoy um, and that I've enjoyed over the years. And the main, uh, the main objective of today's session is to give you some ideas and learn also from you on uh, tips and, and the best way to reach out to teens and, uh, you know, take them, um, make them move forward in the practice of learning English in the 21st century. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've been teaching English to teens for quite a long time. This was actually me teaching my teens not that long ago before the pandemic. Um, I had a sort of like a regular traditional classroom and I had the opportunity to interact with my teenagers uh, regularly. And uh, because of the pandemic, I, I had to migrate to this new reality. So this photo, I got it just this past Saturday when I had a class with my teens and I had the opportunity to interact with them through Zoom. Uh, so I've been teaching um, teenagers English, both in the regular traditional classroom setting, but also because of the pandemic now um, uh, digitally as well, virtually as well. And so what we're gonna get to discuss today has a bit to do with both um, regular traditional classrooms, but also um, it has to do from uh, or with lessons that I've learned from teaching English to teens in um, the virtual world. And I'm going to try and give you some ideas on how to reach success in teaching English to teenagers, no matter the kind of classroom that you are teaching in. So for that, we're gonna be talking about four key points or four key ideas throughout the session today. First of all, we're gonna talk about uh, what I've learned about teaching through content and what sort of importance does teaching through content has when it comes to teaching English to teens. Then we're gonna talk about um, best ways for introducing and get teens to practice vocabulary and grammar um, communicatively. We're going to also take a look at how to practice the skills, reading, listening, speaking, and writing communicatively as well, in order to use those practices as a springboard into um, production and communication in the language. And at the end, we're going to talk about the role of technology and some ideas that I've gathered on using video and online platforms for teaching teens. Okay. But um, most importantly, what I plan to do today, it's not just to give you a lecture on the things that I've learned, but rather I would also love to hear it from you. I would also love to get your ideas, get your impressions and your tips on or best practices on um, how to teach English to teens successfully. So I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions and I would love to um, take a look at your answers and your own experiences through the chat. So uh, let's just get, um, Let's just get going and let's begin by um, talking about the importance of teaching through content. Um, the first lesson that I would love to share with you is uh, that I've learned that teaching through content is essential when you want to teach English to teenagers. You know that um, modern developments in language teaching include content based instruction or CBI or content and language integrated learning, what we know as CLEAL in which learners are provided instruction in real world content or subject matter via a foreign language. If you had the opportunity 
to use any of those methodologies for teaching English to teenagers, I think you're getting ready for great fun and a lot of success because it's been demonstrated that teenagers truly enjoy learning not just the mechanics of the language, but most importantly, the way language functions, the way language works and the way language allows for them to find answers to the most important and existential question that they have in this period. We got to remember that as, as teens, they're going through a lot of changes. They're going through a lot of even traumatic episodes in which their bodies are changing and their realities are changing as well. And so the one thing that keeps their minds busy, the one question that they're always trying to answer as they blossom and grow up and as you're trying to teach them the present progressive, if you may, is who am I and what can I do? with my life? That's the key existential question that teenagers need to answer in their teenagehood process. Who am I and what can I be? What can I do with my life? And trust me, they're not gonna find an answer to that question by conjugating verbs in a regular past or memorizing, lex memorizing lexical families. But they're gonna possibly find an answer to that existential question by getting to know the world and everything in it. That is why I think that teaching through content, teaching English through content is extremely important. So if you had the opportunity to teach English through CBI or CLIL, go for it. But if you didn't, even if your primary aim is to introduce your students to English and not really content, then try thematic instruction. Um, I believe that the language should always be contextualized. And in that way, you can help your students develop an appreciation and understanding of world cultures, the environment, general knowledge, geography, health, history, science, sociology, and so on. That doesn't mean that you're going to stop teaching English to become a science teacher or a geography teacher or a history teacher. But rather, it means that you're going to be presenting the language in action through themes, through topics, through contexts that would allow for students not only to practice the language further, but at the same time, perhaps find an answer, a possible answer to their existential question of who am I and what can I be? So what I've done, what I've learned uh, when it comes to the importance of teaching through content when teaching teens has to do with making full use of images to help my teens understand more about their world. I'm, I'm, I'm very um, convinced on the idea of bringing the world into the classroom by means of images, by means of text, by means of video. Uh, have your teens describe what they see in photos, in posters, in videos. Uh, have them make connections between the photographs or the visual input, whatever that might be. The content of your unit, if you're teaching about, you know, uh, items of clothing or extreme sports or whatever the topic that you're teaching in their own world. And so you can use that visual input in order for them to get familiar with the world and everything in it, and at the same time, establish connections with their own world. It's visual literacy, as Lenk is saying in the chat, absolutely. And if you want to move forward on this idea of using content and cross-curricular approaches in order to teach the language to teens, what about doing some a, a, a bit of a, a geography uh, lesson in which you have your students look up country or city names on a map to help develop their geographical awareness. So, for example, not that long ago, um, I taught a class on festivals and celebrations around the world. And so we talked about the Holy Festival in India and we talked about the carnival in Rio de Janeiro. And so as part of my class, I brought in a world map and I had my students locate uh, those countries and those cities in a world map. It's not that big of a deal, but you are indeed bringing the world into the classroom and you are allowing your students to see how language really works in a real world setting, right? Um, or perhaps, 
Have your students find out more, present them with a challenge, with a project, have them find out more about the content you're teaching them. And this could be given as homework task. For example, um, you can say, find out one fact about a sea turtle or a dugong or, and, and share with class next week. No matter the topic, there's always something, there's always a fact an interesting idea that they can find online and then bring into the classroom in order to share with their classmates. And in that way, you are moving the lesson, not only you're, you're moving the lesson outside of the classroom in order for students to see that English is not just uh, framed by the classroom activity, but rather they can use English to access the world um, in their own time. So at the end, I think that teaching through content allows for your students to think critically. You can encourage them to compare and contrast content with their own cultures between two different cultures. So they practice the language further. And at the same time, they develop an appreciation of the world and everything in it. And that sort of appreciation that's very much needed uh, right now. So for example, just to give you an idea, Imagine you prepare a lesson about school. Let's say you're teaching a class, it's um, uh, basic English. You're teaching English 101, for example, and um, you're teaching a lesson about school. You have your, your vocabulary target in which you're gonna be teaching about school objects, and maybe you have a grammatical uh, object. Perhaps you're gonna be teaching prepositions of place so students learn to say things like, um, I don't know, uh, the, the book, it's next to the chair, or um, the eraser is under the table, things that are very simple. So you have your traditional English language objectives on the topics of school. What other things can you do in order for that lesson to go into a more global perspective? What can you do with the topic of school? What sort of questions, what sort of input can you present to your students in order for them to use that content to go global and to develop an appreciation of the world and everything in it. Any idea? Schools in other cultures. Thank you, Cecilia. Absolutely. Very good. So maybe you can present them with um, photos or even videos of uh, how schools look like in other cultures. And not only the school by means of a building, but perhaps, um, I don't know, schedules. So they can see what are the typical subjects taught in different places in the world, right? Or what time do people typically go to school in different countries? Things like that, that would concentrate on the main topic, but would, would also allow them to go global. Uniforms, absolutely. The education system, after school activities, fantastic. Compared a typical uh, school day in two or three days, different subjects. Love it. Thank you very much for your very insightful comments in the chat. So yes, absolutely. You can um, you can tell them, you can show them about education around the world. They can practice country names. They can take a look at schools and children around the world by means of analyzing uniforms, schedules, different systems. Uh, they can practice questioning like, where do you live? How do you travel to school? What sports do you practice in your uh, PE uh, lesson? Um, they can learn to share information about their own culture. I travel to school by bus. I walk to school, et cetera, et cetera. So in that way, you're, you're still targeting the main topic of the unit, which is school. But at the same time, you're helping your students develop an appreciation of the world and everything in it. And for teenagers, that's far more interesting than just memorizing a grammatical structure or, you know, um, a lexical family. So I strongly believe that, I strongly believe that by becoming global learners, your students will understand more about the world they inhabit. By doing this sort of activities, your students will develop a deeper understanding of the world as a whole as they learn and practice English. Your students will develop a deeper understanding, tolerance and respect of other cultures, which is so essential right now. 
they would also develop a deeper understanding and appreciation of their own culture from the position of a more global perspective. They would develop a greater understanding of the issues the world faces. So imagine, for example, that you are that you are teaching your lesson on schools and then you present your students with a little reading or perhaps a video in which they get to see how teens from other parts of the world commute to go to school and the sort of challenges teens face in order to get to school every day. So in that way, they develop a greater understanding of the issues the world faces. They can think creatively about responding to global issues. They develop the skills needed to function in an ever increasing global society and realize a need for bilingualism or even multilingualism and increase their motivation to study the target language. In this case, English as the true global language of our times. So all of these are true benefits of teaching through content to help your students to become global learners. And it's, it's only logical to do this because we're teaching the true most global language of our times, which is English, right? So one, the first lesson that I've learned from teaching English to teens and that I wanted to share with you is this idea of teaching through content putting together thematic instruction and helping our teams become global learners at the same time they learn and practice English. That's lesson number one. That is the first lesson that I've learned from teaching English to teens. Now, lesson number two has to do with a more practical activity, which is teaching vocabulary. Okay. And Teaching vocabulary is something that I've always put a lot of attention on. I'm a true believer on the benefits of the lexical approach. So I always try to begin my lessons, no matter the, uh, no matter the topic that I'm teaching, no matter the context that I'm trying to present or introduce to my students, I typically begin my lessons by means of contextualizing the content and presenting lexis presenting vocabulary, because I strongly believe that the one thing that is essential for students to learn and practice a language is words, not even grammar. Grammar is extremely important, and we're going to be talking about grammar in a minute. But grammar at the end is a set of rules for putting words together in a cohesive and coherent way. So what is needed for those rules to function? You need words. So let's begin with the most basic unit of language, which is teaching vocabulary. And so I got a question for you on that sense. What is needed to successfully know a word? When you really want for your students to learn a word or to learn a group of words, what is it that you need for them to truly learn it? You need connections, you need context, very good. Spelling and meaning, thank you. You did pictures, very good. Watch, use it in context, usage. Spelling, meaning, pronunciation, using context, visualization. Fantastic, amazing ideas in the chat. Thank you very much. The way it works in a context, fantastic association, uh, pronunciation, synonyms, antonyms, use, repetition, fantastic. So. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Successfully knowing a word requires a learner to understand its meaning, its form, and its usage, right? If you really want to make sure that your teenagers are truly learning a word or the key target vocabulary um, uh, from a unit of instruction, you got to make sure that you present that vocabulary in a three-dimensional way in which you um, you target the meaning of the word, you target the form of the word, and you target, even more importantly, its usage, right? So I, what I've done in order to accommodate to this reality of teaching vocabulary from a three-dimensional perspective, meaning, form, and use, is I provide my students with the opportunity to encounter new words through incidental learning. 
I don't really use a lot of, let's say, flashcards um, for my students to see a word, to see an image and repeat, which is what we typically do when teaching younger kids. But for teenagers, that idea of, you know, holding up a flashcard and saying, this is a table, repeat after me, table, table, and then you repeat a hundred times and your students repeat after you, that might get them to pronounce the word perfectly, but you're not truly presenting usage. And sometimes you're not even presenting a meaning. If the image is not that clear, they, they're going to have issues trying to understand the meaning of the word. So rather than that, they should discover very good, as someone's mentioning in the chat, they should discover the meaning in context. And that is what I meant by incidental learning. They come across the word by means of analyzing images, by means of listening to some recordings, by means of watching a video, by means of reading a text. They come across the words, they are repeatedly exposed to key vocabulary in different contexts. And then I encourage my students to produce the vocabulary in communication activities. So in order for this to um, become um, you know, a reality, I've devised some sort of a process, a four steps process in which number one, what I typically do is I introduce vocabulary in contextualized tasks. I present the vocabulary by means of using a lot of images, by means of using audio, video, and reading texts uh, whenever possible. Then we build on vocabulary through conversation, grammar, and reading practice. After that, after they've been getting familiar with the way the vocabulary works in, in readings, in conversations, after they've um, analyzed the form of the vocabulary by means of um, more mechanical practices, we reinforce vocabulary through listening and video tasks. And at the end, I give my students the opportunity to practice using the words for themselves via both spoken and written activities. So you go step by step in a very scaffolded process from introducing vocabulary in contextualized activities using a lot of visual input and then presenting that vocabulary through conversations, through grammar practice, through reading practice. And then we reinforce that vocabulary perhaps through a listening or a video activity. And then finally, once they've got familiar with the vocabulary, once they've acquired the form, the meaning of the vocabulary, let's challenge them to use that vocabulary communicatively, both by speaking it and uh, writing about it, right? And uh, in that process, I've gathered ideas on uh, what's needed in order to teach vocabulary successfully. And those three things, those three things always have worked out really nicely for me. Number one, I always ask my teenagers to keep a vocabulary notebook, some sort of a glossary, if you may, in which they write the word. If needed, they write a part of speech. They write a definition in English or maybe a definition in their first language. And this I know that are um, school policies that uh, don't allow for teachers to use any uh, first language in the classroom. But if you had the opportunity, I'm a true believer of the importance of using your first language to um, acquire a foreign language. So if my students are struggling understanding the meaning or the form of a key vocabulary item in the target language, why not using their native language to clarify meaning and make sure that they're truly understanding it? And then I always demand for my students to write example sentences using the word in English, of course. So for example, this photo that I, that I have on the screen right now, this is a vocab notebook of one of my students in which she decided, and she made that decision by herself, she decided to translate all of the key target vocabulary into Spanish, which is her native language. 
So you see here in black, she has the word in English, and in blue, she has the word in Spanish to make sure that she has truly understood all of the words that I presented to her in context. But then underneath, you see that she wrote sentences and those sentences are not in Spanish because they have to be presented in the target language. So this is an evidence of um, acquisition of vocabulary and that she's understood not only the meaning, but also the form and use of vocabulary. And it's that's that's one of the benefits of having a vocab notebook that you always have the evidence available, right? Um, is this a task that I assign to my students? More than a task, it becomes a routine. I always let them know at the beginning of the course that every time we begin a new unit, they should make notes on their vocab notebook in which they enlist the key target vocabulary that I present to them. And they have then to develop um, example sentences. And as Edison is suggesting, you can also include an image or an illustration to the list. Absolutely. They can be very creative on that way. This is another example. So in this particular case, my um, my um, student, it's the same lesson, but she's not using um, as much Spanish as my other student did because she didn't feel like needing a lot of the vocabulary. Um, translate it. And she has also her own set of words. Um, yes, and the words in the notebook, they, they, typically, they typically include the target vocabulary uh, presented either in the course book or the target vocabulary that I know should be presented to my students at the beginning of the lesson. Yes. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, uh, it, they're completely connected, the target vocabulary from the course book and the target vocabulary in the vocab notebook. Another thing that I've learned to um, do when teaching vocabulary to teens is to play vocab games because they promote fun, playful, and interactive use of vocabulary. And uh, a lot of teachers have told me, yeah, but those games are more like for younger kids Teenagers don't really enjoy playing games for practicing words. And I'm like, are you really sure? Because based on my experience, my teenagers go crazy whenever I bring in a, um, a, a, a game to my classroom. Um, it could be Scrabble, for example, absolutely, or even simpler games like a memory game. Let's play a memory game in which they have to find pairs. Like you can go from, you can go from pairing words and images, like this one here, in which I'm pairing arm with its image, or you can use vocabulary in context. You should rest at home for at least two days when you get sick, for example. And by playing those games, they reinforce vocabulary practice, and at the same time, they have fun. Um, they interact with the language in a sort of like gamified, ludic way. Um, word jumbles, scrabble, absolutely. So playing vocab games actually allow for students to feel at ease and to develop confidence in practicing vocabulary in a very playful and interactive way. And as I mentioned before, another thing that I always do and I always recommend teachers of teens doing is use as much video as possible, particularly for giving your students the opportunity to see language in action. So they can practice target vocabulary by means of watching a real interactive video in which they can see uh, how the content and the context that we were talking about before interacts with the vocabulary in order to make sense and in order to express thoughts and ideas in a very cohesive and coherent way. So again, best tips for um, teaching vocabulary to teens. Keep a vocab notebook, play vocabulary games, and reinforce vocabulary through video whenever possible. 
those are things that have worked wonders for me um, in my experience teaching English to teens. It's a lesson that I've learned on how to teach vocabulary, and I wanted to share those ideas with you. So lesson number three, lesson number one was content and thematic instruction. Remember, lesson number two was teaching vocabulary. Lesson number three is a bit more complex because now we're talking about teaching grammar to teens. I've always, I've always thought of grammar as an essential part of language, but I also realized that my students, my teen students are not crazy about grammar because they think that grammar might be a bit boring, might be very repetitive and mechanical, and they, they don't get to see or understand the benefit of learning and practicing grammar. And perhaps that has to do with the way grammar has been traditionally presented to them in, in a very mechanical way based on memory rather than function and communication. And if we, if we get to our class by, um, and, and, and we told our students, today we're gonna talk about the present perfect progressive. That to begin with, it's completely meaningless to a teenager's mind. Right. Or if you assess your students attainment of English or capabilities or competence in English by getting them to conjugate 135 verbs in regular past, again, that's completely meaningless to their understanding. Rather than that, I always recommend teachers to try and teach grammar communicatively. And for that, we all got to get familiar with the aims of the communicative language teaching method. And the most important aim of the CLT method is to develop the communicative competence of our students. We should always be aware of these four key aspects of communicative language teaching. The first one, getting learners communicating with one another in the target language facilitates language learning. No matter what they're teaching, no matter if they're teaching vocabulary or grammar or pronunciation, if you're practicing listening, reading, speaking or writing, your most important aim should always be facilitating communication, right? And so the best way to do that is by communicating. It's only logical, right? Getting learners involved in meaningful tasks tasks in which they need to use the target language facilitates language learning. Again, if I'm gonna be focusing on grammar on any given lesson, I gotta make sure that I present that grammar in meaningful tasks, through meaningful tasks. And there is nothing very, uh, there is not a lot of meaningfulness in memorizing 135 verbs in regular past. But there is a lot of mean, a lot of meaningfulness in learning to use such verbs to express thoughts and ideas in English. So that is also something to consider at the moment of teaching grammar communicatively. Using language that it's meaningful for learners facilitates language learning. So meaningfulness, purposefulness, and relevance of language is extremely important for teenagers to pay attention to feel motivated to practice the language further and to understand it to its highest um, extent. And number four, and this is um, extremely important for all of us teachers to understand, errors are an important part of language learning and they should be tolerated if not embraced by the teacher. Your teenage students, you gotta remember that they are emotionally vulnerable. They're going through a lot of changes in their lives, both uh, in the outside, but also in the inside. They have in hormonal imbalances. Um, they're, they're all over the place when it comes to um, different ways of thinking and understanding reality. We should always try to make them understand that it is okay to be wrong in your class, that errors are an important part of the language learning process that they are actually entitled to give you the wrong answer because that's what makes that what makes them learners. They're not experts in the language. They have the right to be wrong because that's essential in the learning process. 
let your teenagers know that when particularly when you're practicing grammar with them and I assure you magic will happen because at the end the aim of teaching grammar is to equip your students with the skills to communicate by using the target language in a meaningful way. Grammar is a means to an end and not the end itself. Grammar should provide cohesion and coherence to language, but it's not the language practice that you should always target in your classes. Because at the end, you can say very little with grammar, but you can say a lot with uh, thoughts and ideas in the language being put together coherently and cohesively. So what is it that I typically do in order to teach grammar more communicatively? Same as in um, the vocab practice, I put together some sort of a process or a method for presenting grammar to my students. The first thing I do is I don't I don't show my students the grammatical structure or the rule or the or, or the grammar chart at the beginning. Rather, I contextualize grammar always within a conversation. It could also be a reading, but I prefer contextualizing grammar through conversations because conversations naturally lead to communicative practice and communicative understanding of the language. So I typically contextualize grammar within a conversation to make it meaningful for students. Once they're familiar with the way the structure looks like, the way the structure sounds, the way it's used in this contextualized conversational practice, then we focus on form by examining a language chart. Not before. I don't typically recommend teachers to begin teaching grammar deductively to teenagers. I don't recommend teen teachers or teachers of teens actually to present the grammar chart at the very beginning. But let's use it once the contextualized practice is over. So you go from a broader uh, use of grammar through conversations to a more detailed analysis of the grammar structure by means of examining perhaps a language chart, for example, right? And then once that um, focus on form is done in the chart, I can guide my students through the structures, the use of the structure in several controlled activities in order to provide them with uh, you know, assurance and confidence. I typically use more mechanical grammar practices, uh, filling the get, filling the blanks, matching, drilling, in order for them to feel safe at the beginning, right? So I guide them through the structures practice in several controlled activities. And as they move through the activities, I start to take the scaffolds away. And I always end up challenging them to communicate with one another in a final free communicative activity in which they are challenged to use that grammatical structure with their own language. They've acquired the vocabulary already. They're familiar with vocabulary. They now have the structure. It is about time that they start putting those things together in order to communicate with one another in a final free communicative activity. This is the steps um, this is the process that I put together for teaching grammar communicatively to my teens. Contextualize grammar first within a conversation. You could contextualize it also through a reading, but I prefer conversations again because they naturally lead to communicative practice. Number two, once the contextualized conversation is done, I focus on form by examining a language chart. Number three, I guide my students through the structures in several controlled activities, mechanical practice. And then number four, I go from mechanical to open-ended to communicative activities in which, they're tar um, in which they target the use of the previously taught vocabulary and uh, grammar. Would you give them the tape script at some point. You mean the tape script, um, you mean the audio script from um, from the conversation? If that's, uh, uh, absolutely, 
they can totally not only listen to the conversation, but they can do also some sort of a reading practice by means of taking a look at the audio script or the video script if you're using video. Absolutely. Yes. Very good. So that would be that would be lesson number four in which we're teaching grammar communicatively by means of contextualizing, focusing on form, doing control activities first, and then moving into more communicative, open-ended activities at the end. And that is, again, uh, one lesson that I've learned from teaching English to teens. I always need to make grammar as communicative as possible in order for my students to get familiar with language and feel motivated to practice it, okay? So now, um, the next lesson that I wanted to share with you is how to teach listening and reading communicatively. How to teach listening and reading communicatively. I believe that listening and reading are, by their nature, receptive skills. And I, I've always believed that many of my teens benefit from a receptive period of listening or reading and working alone before being asked to communicate. So that idea of getting into the classroom and telling my students, open your book on page number 25, listen to this audio or read the text on the page and answer the questions. It's putting a lot of stress, putting a heavy burden on your teenager's shoulders. Rather than that, if time allows, I would allow for them to listen to the audio or read the text on their own without having an, you know, um, a, a task to perform. Just listening, just reading to become familiar with the content, the context, the key target vocabulary, the grammatical structure included in, um, in the audio or the reading. And then after that, after they become familiar with the way language sounds or the way language looks in the text, then I can start with uh, this process uh, that I typically use for receptive activities in order to make them more communicative. Um, step number one in this process is I typically, even if it's only an audio practice, a listening practice or a reading practice, I try to include an image. Because again, teenagers are visual almost to 100%. So I typically start with images. I get them together in pairs perhaps, and I, I have them describe what they see to each other, right? So they can describe the image or if it's reading, they can um, take a look at the main title of the reading or perhaps um, describe um, the scene or the image or the photo that accompanies the reading in order to um, get them familiar with the most important aspect of the reading or the audio, which is main ideas. Then step number two would be activate schemata. Get your students thinking about the topic they will listen to or read about have them predict, do brainstorming activities in order for them to use prior knowledge and in that way, become more interested in the main topic of the um, um, input that you're about to present to them. Notice how we've already read or listened by ourselves or they have already listened or read by themselves in silence. They have already analyzed the images you have already discussed um, the main title or the main context with them in order to activate schemata. We haven't presented the audio or the reading yet. This is more like paving the way into understanding the audio or understanding the reading uh, for my students. Get them familiar with the input. Play the listening track, as I mentioned before, or have them read the text without assigning a tax a task, have them share what they heard or what they read with a partner. And then once you're over those warm up um, activities, if you may, then in here between number three and number four, you can work with the activities that typically come in a textbook. 
which are listening comprehension questions or reading comprehension questions. This is where you insert the actual activities from the page of a book, right? But notice how there is a whole process to be followed before presenting the audio or before presenting the text for your students. So you start with the images, you activate schemata, you get them familiar with the input, and then right here in the middle of three and four, you can insert the actual more mechanical activities that are included in textbooks. And then number four, at the end, once they've listened to uh, an audio, once they've read a text, get them to produce. Ask follow-up questions, promote critical thinking, challenge learners with a project based on the input they received. If they listen to uh, an audio, if they read a text, they have now enough input in order for them to answer questions or ask follow-up que follow questions or maybe predict what's going to happen next or change the ending of the story, et cetera, et cetera. So focus on critical thinking at the end once you've followed all this process, okay? And I strongly believe that this will serve as the basis for production, for communication. Notice how we're talking about listening and reading, receiving language, presenting the input to students. But those listening and reading activities should always be followed by productive activities, communicative activities. And that's sometimes where most teachers struggle uh, at the moment of getting students to communicate. Because the reality is that we may find learners are a bit reluctant to produce in the to produce the language and try to speak English in the classroom. And by producing, I'm not only talking about speaking, but also writing. They can be shy. They can be reticent, afraid of making mistakes, fearful of appearing foolish in front of their classmates and unwilling to take risks. So to avoid too much teacher talk, student silence and little meaningful communication, how can you get your students communicating in the classroom? Based on your experience, what are the things that you typically do in order to get your students communicating? We've done, we've done the listening, we've done the reading, they've received input, we've done the grammar bit, we've done the vocab bit. It is now time for them to start producing the language. How do you typically set up those activities? What is it that you do in order to get your students communicating in the classroom? Group discussions, teamwork, interviews, pair work. Give them a task in groups or pairs. Branching out activities, absolutely. Information exchange. Task-based learning, by all means, give them a task, give them a project, give them a challenge. Use visuals in order to promote communication. Beautiful, very nice. Have them compare and contrast, very good. All of those activities are essential and they are truly communicative. But you got to keep in mind that even before you set up those activities, the first thing that you need to do in order to make sure your students are willing to communicate is you got to create a classroom environment in which your teens feel safe and willing to take risks. Give them the opportunity, give them the reassurance that again, it is okay to be wrong. Even if you mispronounce a word, even if you use the wrong grammatical structure or the wrong lexical term, no one will make fun of you. Bullying is forbidden. Our classroom environment, it's safe and, and it's worth for you to take the risk because mistakes are educational in my class. And you got to be very vocal. You got to let your students know this. And maybe you can think, well, that's pretty obvious. It might be obvious for you, but it's not always that obvious for a teenager. So let them know that it is okay to be wrong, that no one is allowed to make fun of them uh, based on their production, um, and that, it's, that, that you've created a safe classroom environment for them to start taking the risk of communicating 
in the target language, right? So absolutely, our classroom must be a shelter for students. I'm totally with you on that one. Treat errors as a natural part of the learning process. Bring the learner's own personal experiences into this, the speaking tasks whenever possible. And that is something that was already mentioned in the chat. Use the classroom space in innovative ways. Get your students um, to stand facing each other in a line at the front or back of the room. Have them do the speaking task and then move to the next person. Have them repeat the speaking task with a new partner. So it's some sort of a jigsaw informational practice or use breakout rooms. If you're teaching on Zoom, maybe you're saying, well, but those activities, those ideas are great for traditional classroom settings. Well, not really. How about taking advantage of breakout rooms in order to have uh, many groups in which students can exchange ideas on their own without being uh, put under the full class spotlight, right? At the end, you can also encourage friendly competition among your students. Uh, have them divided in groups. Which group can keep the conversation going the longest? Which group is the first to get survey answers from 10 different students? Things that would actually, you know, trigger some sort of encouragement or motivation for them to communicate. You presented the grammar, you presented the vocabulary, you practice the listening, the pronunciation, you practice the reading comprehension. There is no excuse for them to, um, you know, avoid communication. It's typically more of an emotional um, sort of like wall rather than a true language wall, what they have. And by doing those things in which you create a classroom environment in which they feel safe, when they realize that you're treating errors as a natural part of the learning process, that's when magic happens. And that's, that's when they get more than willing to communicate and to participate in your class, which is again, our ultimate goal as language teachers. Last but not least, let me just very quickly jump into um, using video in the classroom. I strongly believe that video can add a new and exciting dimension to classroom learning. There are many, many advantages of using video and we've mentioned a few already. Uh, I think that learners can be exposed to a range of authentic material and they can encounter the target language in a natural context. I think that video allows for our teens to get some help in their comprehension of the input with the use of visual cues as well as audio ones. I totally believe that video can accommodate uh, learners with different learning styles visual styles, auditory styles, even kinesthetic styles, if the video allows for them to move around. And most importantly, video may hold the learner's interest and attention for a longer time than listening and may facilitate learner motivation. But then it's not only the advantages of using video, but perhaps more importantly, it's how you use it to promote learning and communication in the classroom. These are some ideas or again, a four step process, four steps process that I typically follow when using video in my class. The first step involves not my students, but myself. Before the lesson, before I bring a video into my class, I watch the video myself. I make a note of language that I feel may be difficult for my students and I prepare activities to pre-teach the language based on my knowledge of my students' capabilities and uh, you know, level of English. So the first thing I do before I brought the video into class is again, watch the video myself and find the language that might be troublesome for my students. And then when I bring video to class before playing the video, I pre-teach any difficult language. I have my students predict the content of the video. Um, I activate my students schemata and background knowledge of the topic of the video by asking personal questions. And I have learners ask each other questions to predict the content. What do you think the video is gonna be about? 
based on the information that I previously shared with them. While they watch the video, I first have them sit back, sit back, relax, and watch, and watch the video once all the way through without any assigned task. They watch the video just for the pleasure, if you know what I mean, of watching the video. I have my students check their earlier predictions as to the topic of the video, the main content in the video, and then I play the video a second time and have students answer comprehension questions. And last but not least, after they watch the video, I have my students check their while you watch answers together and I challenge them into productive activities. I have them retell what they saw and heard in the video. I have them discuss video questions with a partner or in small groups or even as a class. And I encourage them to think critically by doing role plays based on the video. And trust me, they truly enjoy this process because they feel safe and confident at the moment of uh, watching a video because they have the language, they have the content, they have the experience. There are no excuses for them not to communicate using the input they receive from the video practice. So that is the final lesson that I wanted to share with you when it came to using video. Following this four steps process in which I get very involved in watching the video myself first even if it's in my textbook, I watch it myself and I detect the language that might be troublesome for my students and I prepare activities to pre-teach that language. Then we do activities before we watch the video, while we watch the video and after we watch the video. And this scaffolded process has been very well received by my, by my students all over the years, okay? So before we um, call it a day, my last, uh, my last thoughts on um, the importance of teaching English to teens, not only in the classroom, but going beyond the classroom as well. I strongly believe that nowadays it is essential that you use online practice platforms for teaching or having students practice the language further beyond the classroom. So no matter the platform you're using, make sure the platform is safe and appropriate for teens. Make sure the design, the look and feel, and the kind of content, it's safe and appropriate for teens. Make sure it is optimized for mobile devices, but it's also desktop and tablet friendly. If possible, make sure there's elements of gamification to motivate learning and for your own benefit, make sure that platform allows you to track students' progress. And uh, with that, you're going to be fully covered when it comes to making sure students are practicing the language beyond the classroom through safe and appropriate um, digital environments. With that, having said that, I think my time is up and I have um, maybe couple of minutes for questions. Um, Emily, I don't know if we have any Q&A uh, opportunities now. Yeah, that would be great. We do have a few minutes. Um, okay. I see one. I'm just pulling up the Q&A box now from Georgina of asking about songs. Do you recommend them for teens? I do recommend songs for teens, but you got to be very careful on the kind of songs that you pick. Because, uh, I mean, I love the wheels on the bus go round and round, but I don't think a 13 or 14 year old student would truly appreciate using those songs, which are the typical kind of songs that we have in textbooks. So uh, absolutely, um, if you're using real world songs, make sure that the language accommodates to the context or the key target vocabulary or grammar that you're using and that the language is also safe because you don't want to present uh, songs including uh, you know, profanities or any sort of crazy language to teenagers. Uh, but uh, other than that, I would totally use songs in my classes, uh, just making sure that the key target language or at least the context of the unit um, is, um, it's, you know, somehow presented in the song. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Um, I do see one question 
from an anonymous attendee asking, uh, do, 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 do. I sometimes get students asking me not to do pair work with a particular student as they don't understand them when they speak. How would you suggest dealing with that? Um, I think that that's a very good question. It, it's happened to me. And to be honest with you, um, well, it all depends on the dynamics of your class. For example, now that I'm using Zoom uh, and breakout rooms, I don't even get involved in pairing them. Uh, I don't pick who's going to pair with who. I just let Zoom do it for me randomly. But if you're in a classroom and uh, you know that there's one particular student that perhaps um, is going to you know, be some sort of a problem to pair with because of the way that student behaves or maybe his or her pronunciation, make sure you're picking the right person to pair that student with. But at the end, if one student presents you with some sort of a complaint saying, I don't want to work with that other student, my advice would be respect that. Because otherwise, you're going to put them both in a problematic situation. And then what I've got to do is that other student that was not picked or that was sort of like rejected, he ended up working with me and he becomes some sort of my teacher's pet for that particular practice. And in that way, he feels pampered and protected as well. Great advice. I just see, I think we have time for one last one. And it's from Nicholas asking about following the four steps of using videos. Can you do that in one class or does that typically take more than one class? Um, it all depends how long your class is. But if you're teaching a class of, let's say, 50, 60 minutes, you can totally go from uh, the before you watch, while you watch and after you watch in a single class. Yes. Uh, then again, one thing I didn't mention is I don't think videos for teens should be that long. They should span from, let's say, three and a half to five minutes so that uh, their attention is always focused on the main topic and they don't start wandering around after a minute five of watching a video. Uh, but other than that, I do think that um, the before, while, and after you watch process can be completed in a regular 50 to 60 minutes class. Absolutely. That's good to know. Great. And just as we wrap up here, first off, huge thank you to our presenter today, Jair. Thank you for these sessions. I'm just seeing an overwhelming amount of people saying, thank you so much. It was so practical. I can use this. So I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, I did put it in the chat box a little bit earlier, but it's been moving pretty quickly. Most of the examples that Jair used today, and there was actually a great video that we didn't have time for, right. but they're from um, Time Zones third edition. So the image on the screen right now is up of the covers. It's brand new third edition. I will put the link to our catalog page for it. If you're interested in learning more and uh, requesting a sample of it, you can contact your local National Geographic Learning Representative too on our website if you have any questions. Um, but I'll just put that into the chat box now. And just a few other things as we wrap up. I know we're at time. We'll be sending you all a certificate for joining us today. That will come in within three days. And then we will be posting the recording of this session on the same website where you registered for. Um, so you can check it out there if you want to refer to anything that Shayir mentioned in the session. Uh, we will have the recording. So feel free to share that with your colleagues as well. And um, Jair has his email address up here. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Jair. Uh, just um, if you if you have any further questions or comments, um, any um, tips or ideas that you would like to share with me, I'll be more than happy to get them through email. Um, and I certainly hope to hear from you all very soon. Great. Thanks all for being here. We hope you can join us for another webinar. We have two more left in our current season until we take a little bit of a hiatus till the fall. Um, so you can register on the same site where you joined this one. We have one next week that's about encouraging parental engagement for very young learners and young learners and then we have one in early may presented by jean hughes and that's all about developing confident communicators in the english language classroom so we hope we see you again and i hope you all have a great rest of your morning afternoon or evening all right everyone you're going to be directed to a feedback survey now uh, we'd love if you let us know what you thought take care stay safe bye bye <laughs> Hi, all.